Hey folks, how y'all doing? I'm Kurt Weigel, this is Game Geeks, and today we're gonna to be talking about Tales from the Loop. Now you may recognize some of the art embedded in and on the cover of this book. It's by St Simon Stallenhag, and I will at this point confess my complete ignorance of all things Swedish and Scandinavian. My pronunciations are going to be bad. I apologize in advance. This is a game that is nominally set in the 80s that never was, meaning you play children in the 1980s in a moderate-sized town where there are strange things going on. Now, the strange things in this case is the town houses or is right outside of a very large particle accelerator. And some time ago, odd and strange technologies have developed or come through and become sort of part of the landscape. This is what the artist, Simon Stellenhag, has done in the creation of this universe. He has set up this idea where you have this combination of the mundane 80s and the weird technology that may or may not still do things. It's become embedded in the background of the setting, literally and figuratively. In order to enhance this feeling of the 80s that they have going on, they actually give you tips about what was going on in the 80s at that time for those of you players who aren't embedded and drew, grew up in the 80s, some of you younger folk. So it gives you a lot of really good ideas for capturing that feel, such as songs that were popular at that time, so you could have a soundtrack going on in the background, TV that was, in, that was popular, movies that were going on that were big, and role-playing games. And it also gives you all of this from the point of view of Sweden and the United States, because there are two possible settings for this. I really appreciate that about the authors of this game, because otherwise I would have to do a lot of research and try to convince my players to suspend themselves in the era of the 80s in Sweden, whereas they wouldn't have as much trouble suspending themselves in the era of the 80s in the United States. The two towns that you can play in in this are the Malarin facility in Sweden, I'm not going to talk much about that, and the Boulder City facility in Colorado. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Now, if a lot of this feels like it's Stranger Things, the role-playing game, that's, I don't know if that's intentional or not, but it's certainly very, very applicable. I feel that one thing this game lacks is the horror of the Stranger Things series. And for those of you who have been living under a rock for the past year or so, Stranger Things is an absolutely fantastic Netflix series that came out last year, season two comes out this year around Halloween, and it is very well done, it is extremely well written, it's a tight story, there's not a whole lot of fluff, the characters go through development, and to be quite frank with you, it's applicable for a lot of people who don't like to wallow in 80s nostalgia porn like I do. What characters do you play in this game? Well. It, it, you play children. All right, sounds creepy, but go on. You play children with the basic idea of somewhere between the ages of 11 and 15. If you hit 16, you've aged out. Now, this is for a few reasons, I think. One, children have a more inherent sense of being threatened and being in danger. The 16-year-old, well, they can get in the car and drive away. The child, well, they can get on their bike and pedal away as fast as they possibly can. Okay, it makes sense. Follow up to that is there's also a sense of wonder that you should get while playing children. That these, strange, these are new and strange things and the new and strange don't need to be crushed and smashed and annihilated or viciously studied like adults tend to do. They can just be accepted as strange and look into them. The characters you play in this fall into basic archetypes. Now, the basic archetypes will also tell you what your attributes are. I'm going to go through the list of the archetypes first, and then we'll talk about the attributes that go with them and the skills, and then go into the engine itself. The archetypes are the bookworm, the computer geek, a hick, jock, popular kid, rocker, troublemaker, and weirdo. Each one of these gives you points in some of the attributes. Now, the attributes range in rating from 1 to 5, and those include body, tech, heart, and mind. 
the skills are each of a subset of those attributes. For example, under body, you have sneak, force, and move, while under mind, you have investigate, comprehend, and empathize. All right, all that adds up. So you have a, a number between one to five for your attribute and a number between zero and five for your skill. You roll a pool of six-sided die to whatever that sums to, and then what happens is you roll the dice and every six you get is a success. That seems pretty darn steep, to be honest with you. I'll remind, and it is, quite frankly, I'll remind you that you are playing children that are not uber specialized or uber wonderful at anything. Please don't fill up the comment section telling us how each one of you was a savant at something when you were 12. But what you also have to realize is the success chart is actually fairly small. One success is your standard difficulty. Two successes is considered extremely difficult, and three is almost impossible. That softens that fairly steep curve really, really well. Okay. Now, each character, in addition to their attributes and skills, also has a number of things that define them. These number of things fall into general categories. Iconic item, a problem, drive, their pride, relationship to other kids, relationships to NPCs, anchor, and some typical names presented both Scandinavian and American. Under each one of those categories, you can make a decision from the list or choose one of your own. It feels very apocalypse worldy in that way. This book has style for days. It's beautifully stylish. It has a fairly simple rules light engine that also holds up pretty well for what it tries to do. There's not a lot of granularity. There's not a lot of specific detail here, which I think is very appropriate. I don't want to play a game where you're playing kids in, say, GURPS or Hero. Sorry, Micah or one of the really complicated games. I think playing kids needs to be a generalized, broader, softer engine. At the same time, I don't think a setting like this would really do well with the pimp, the, whoa, sorry, wrong word. The pip engine, I don't wanna think what the pimp engine would be for a kid's game. The pip engine that is used by triple, uh, third eye games in their mermaid adventures, camp myth, etc. The last half of this book is involved in telling you how to run kids' games set in this weird, strange universe, how to build the mystery, how to build the tension, how to make it seem normal yet weird at the same time. If you're looking for a different game that is not an old-fashioned or modernized D&D clone, that's not very tactical, that allows you to play the weird and the strange, but with the point of view of the awesome inquisitiveness of the child, you cannot go wrong with Tales from the Loop. I like this a lot. I think it would be a hard sell for some players. I'll be right up front about it. But I think if with the right group, this could be done brilliantly and be a great experience for everybody. The one thing I'm not sure about with this is how well it supports campaign play. One shots or say a four shot would work really well. I don't know about extended play, but maybe I'm wrong. Hopefully I am. This is a cool game and worth looking at. Have fun gaming, y'all.